There we go. Done. I have it. Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> so. So. So you've got the episode and I play and you've got and you've got the prequel on YouTube. I have the prequel on YouTube. Uh, for some reason. Right, okay, so BBC iPlayer, that's that one. That's that one. That one. That one. Okay, I think I have everything. I think I'm ready. Perfect. Perfect. I now just need to find you. Oh, there you are. <laughs> ah, so that's so if I want to pick up to things, right? I'll just work it out to you. Right, I'm in. Perfect. <laughs> oh, I want to exit. We've got five minutes to go. We have, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, uh, luckily I, I tuned in. All right, okay. Um, that's it. So, how's your day been? Yeah, not, not, not bad. Um, well, it was nice to be a bit cooler than it has been. It's been quite hot, hasn't it, recently? <laughs> We, in my back garden in particular, we got lots of birds nesting, and now the uh, the little fledglings are appearing. All right, lovely. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been fun watching them. Uh, yes, it's okay. And although it's the weekend, I've been working, I've been working harder this week, uh, today, than I have for a long time. But it's uh, uh, it's uh, coming up to the end of the month, and um, in August I've got a little project I will be filming. Oh, lovely! Yeah, so uh, so I'm trying to clear everything, hmm. so so that I can sort of relax that in August, because I've got deadlines for my books. All right. Yeah. Dun dun dun. So, uh, but there we go. Uh, <laughs> Is this the second part of your autobiography, or is this another? Well, book? it's actually the third. Because okay. there's because the my Dalek is a puncture, and then the second one was my Dalek is another puncture. They're both out, and I'm selling them uh, quite well at the moment. Oh, very good. Um, and um, so there's a, and then the third one is uh, let zygons be zygons. Uh, and and my deadline is the thirtieth of June. Right. <laughs> and, and it's the 19th. It is, uh, yeah. I, I have a feeling I'm going to miss the deadline, but only by a week, I think. So it's not so bad. What I, I'm aiming for is that it's published in August or September. Because mm. uh, there's, uh, there's always this delay from me saying, right, I've done it, and I send it to my publisher. They then have to go through it and tell me what they like or dislike or, or what their lawyers more often like or dislike uh, uh, so it can be two or three months before it actually gets published hmm. so um, uh, but that's it so it'll be nicer than for Christmas at least there'll be three books that's my aim oh. and I've, I've got uh, two other books that I'm working on as well because I just thought Initially, initially, when lockdown came, I had no work at all. No, uh, my income stream just stopped completely. Mm. And at the time, it was very much, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Because um, uh, for whatever reasons, I didn't qualify for whatever was on offer for to help. So I've had, well, I've had very little. I won't say I've had none, but very little help. Uh, but gradually from August last year, yeah. work started to come in. And But what did happen was I, I managed to get into the 
people are bored, they need things to do. So I pushed my books. Hmm. And so they went, they went quite well. Yeah. And that gave me the incentive to get my third one done. But then meantime, some people who only think of me as a writer so uh, have given me work to do proofreading and and uh, sort of a first edit, as if it were. Mm -hmm. And of course, because uh, there was no money coming, I just took what was on offer. Oh, yeah, uh, so yeah. As a result, I'm a bit behind on my own targets. Mm. But there we go. la -dee da did you get any work from Big Finish during the um, lockdown or? No, I don't know how to answer this. <laughs> well, well, I know. well, between between you and me, yes, I've done a Big Finish, but I cannot tell you anything about it until oh, they no. tell until oh, they no. tell me. No, I can't. I, so um, so uh, I've done what would, would uh, when it comes out, it'll be my fourth. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, so. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'd like to do more with them and other companies. And of course, we've had this surreal situation. Whereas in the past, they'd say, oh, you've got to come to the studio because we got the right technology and blah, blah, blah. Mm. Or you'll have to spend a half a million pounds and build your own suitable studio. <laughs> right? Whereas now I was able to record my stuff. Mm. Uh, from Tony's music room because Tony has a a mocked up studio. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, it's it's not. I by no stretch of the imagination would I call it quote a professional studio as you would imagine a BBC thing. But it's all there, and we can record. And I have. I mean, uh, I've recorded audio books and everything in there. So we. Uh, I can't remember, Clean Stream, was it called? I don't know. But some system they use. So there was me. There was another actor in Brighton and another actor in Warwick. Uh, and it was just all of us were in satellite studios being recorded in the main studio. Hmm. But each of us uh, were doing a backup recording of our own uh, in parts. Yeah. And it worked, you see. Uh, I'm, that's reminded me. I must mention. I must remember. I must remember. Remind me to mention Hawk Chronicles. Hawk Chronicles. Yeah. Yeah. Now, because they they are just to let you know that is an American sci-fi spoof uh, detective series. Yeah. Called the Hawk Chronicles, and all the actors are from around the world. Oh, right. yeah. And we're sent our scripts, and I record it on my phone. Oh, wow. On my phone, unbelievable. And, uh, and so I just record my lines. There's mm -hmm. no direction or anything. We just sent the script, you record your line, send it down. And then the guy at the other end just puts it all together. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's actually quite remarkable. The finished product. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in this, in the sense that I don't even know what the other actors look like. No, no. no. <laughs> it, it was quite difficult not having the, any direction at all when you just kind of got it. So, do you send in multiple um, interpretations of lines and stuff and things like no, that? No, I just, I just send the lines and then I with the I, I'm. I'm always expecting to come back and say, oh, could you do it this way or that way? Mm. Uh, but he rarely does. There was one occasion he wrote the script incorrectly, and so my character was referring to the wrong character. So oh. I, had to, I had to record it all again, but putting in <laughs> the correct character. Uh, Rarely, I must admit. But originally, I was I was asked. It's one of these things that happens. I was just asked as a guest appearance in one episode, yeah. which was episode one hundred and three. And I've just I've just this week recorded episode one hundred and sixty one. <laughs> Better, but it's something I could see. I'm in my man cave here. Mm -hmm. oh, no, I just sit here and do it. It takes. Uh, 10 minutes, if that. Yeah. No, yeah. Very nice, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'll, I'll push that a bit as well. But um, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's nice to have all these new technologies that have stemmed through through having lockdown, and uh, hopefully, you know, feel who you know it can reach more people in terms of doing big finish and things like that who might not want to go to a studio, but now they can do it and cover their own home. So. Well, it, it, I think it's another example. Uh, our industry is always against the trend. You'll get lots of people saying, you can't do that. What mm. makes you think you can do that? No, you can't. And yet, uh, I'm 60 years old and I can tell you everything that people said you can't do, I've done. Yeah. You know, but uh, but also I, it amazes myself that, uh, uh, in particularly in live theatre, I totally respect the producers, but also the dressmakers, the designers of the sets who produce something quite fantastic with a lemonade budget. Yeah. Uh, and of course, all producers have a champagne design in their head. Oh, yeah, of course. And, you, and uh, so, so I know things can done, be done. I think, uh, see, my thing is, you know, if you're thinking about doing a project, spend a long time thinking through the pros and cons. Mm. That's where you spend your time, the pros and cons. And then you think, all, right, all these cons, and then you go down one by one and you think, can I get round that, under that, over that, through that? And if you find you can, mm. and you decided to go ahead, then that's it. You just do it. And uh, the frustrating time is when you then still got people bleating on saying, oh, you can't do that, it's too difficult. <laughs> yeah, the way it's um, um, uh, yeah, it's, I feel always, I feel always again, the living new or change and progress and stuff. So it's um, yeah. a constant battle, isn't it, always, I think, a lot of things. Um, it's, it's understandable. I mean, our industry is one of the few that only survives if people give us money. Yeah, and if you think that, that, that the theatre, particularly the West End, doesn't make any, most of the shows don't make any money from a business plan, you, you would shut it all down, wouldn't you? But of course you need it from a cultural... Well, there's a cultural thing, but what things that don't, uh, it all depends on what people mean by doesn't make any money. Mm. Because if you're sensible, you factor in a payment to yourself yeah mm -hmm. and so when people talk about profits at least you've had a minimum given yourself a minimum fee yeah and so the profits is whatever's after that mm. um uh, and that's a bonus and uh, you know shows are a highly man if that's the phrase. In shows, there's always a performer. Mm. Yeah. You know, and most plays have multiple performers. Uh, and they all need pay. And really? if you think you and if even if you pay them all a minimum wage, that's still quite a sum of money you need coming in every week. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm. I don't know how they work on it now. When I started out, the business plan was 30% uh, on production, 30% on uh, manpower, hmm. and 30% on um, publicity. Yeah. And then the 10% you pay yourself. Right. Right. Mm. That's how it that's how it used to be. And it works quite well. Mm. But it depends. I, I suppose the costs are so much higher these days as well that makes it more sort of Yes, I mean there are fixed costs. I mean it it's quite staggering to hear the <coughs> the big theatre producers that one theatre alone can cost in excess of £30,000 a week, closed. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, you know, because they'll still have to... I don't know, I don't know what relief they got. 
Uh, well, well, I think, you know, I was sort of following it a, a, a little bit because obviously I'm, I'm a, a big theatre fan and, and obviously the, the support came far too late. So it wasn't, wasn't yeah. a good response at all. And a lot of places didn't qualify or only got a small percentage of the pot. So it was kind of a bit sort of, a bit random, I think, in, in terms of what got, got what. And so... I, I, mean, I know Android Repo, I think, is, apparently he's, he's, remor- he's mortgaged his house to keep some of his theatres going, and, and that's somebody that you, um, you know, all powerful, and you think, you know, if he's struggling... You know, what's well, yes, uh, I mean, I mean uh, there are a lot of, uh, not just actors or performers, but there are a lot of self-employed people. Hmm. I won't say they live, they wait for the paycheck every month, but... Uh, they really couldn't afford with no money coming in for more than two or three months. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was I was lucky with some savings. Uh, I, I was able to keep going for about five months, but after that, mm. I definitely needed something coming in just to top up. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, and I think that's what a lot of people don't appreciate. And there's the other people in different sectors. Hmm. where they're on a minimum wage. Yeah. Uh, anyone on minimum wage is expected to live on nothing suddenly. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it, it's been quite um, a sobering experience. I'm, I, me and Tony are lucky. I suppose it's because of our age. <laughs> but we're both self-employed. Hmm. Uh, but uh, Tony only went self-employed about a year or so ago, so he therefore didn't qualify for any self-employed grant because they needed three years' records. Right. Then on a technicality, which is too complicated to go in, I found that I wasn't eligible, and I was at the time quite pissed off because over the years I've really paid into the system and I just feel I should be allowed to get something out of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what do so what do you do when you're not doing this? Um, I'm not doing this, and I'm not planning events. I'm I, um, I'm a recruitment and training officer for a, a care company. Okay. So we look after young adults in their thirties who have severe learning disabilities. Yeah. Right. These behaviours that, that can be challenging, that that sort of thing. So I obviously involved in interviewing and shortlisting applicants, and then teaching things to um you know that our, our staff including first aid and all, all that sort of thing so it's quite a nice little little job and um you know if you feel like you're making a difference at the end of the day so um it's really quite nice really oh it's a it's very worthwhile job. Uh, uh i for two two or three years one job i did i was um a responsible adult mm-hmm. Uh, just to be in a room in certain situations yeah. when there were some vulnerable people who didn't necessarily understand why they were at a certain meeting. Right. And uh, the frustrating thing, of course, was when I could actually see that uh, the candidate wasn't really understanding what they were being asked. I wasn't really allowed, other than to say, now, do you understand? Are you sure? The only thing I was allowed to do was to stop a meeting if I felt. But I found if I, when I did that, I was then not allowed back. Because oh, yeah. I, I could see in certain circumstances, people were being manipulated. And um, because they're not fully functioning, mm. they can't see that they're being, being manipulated. Yeah. Very, it's very sad. Yeah, we, one of the things we, we do is an awful lot of training in, in, in that area about safeguarding and mental capacity and, you know, for people to, to understand that people might not be able to make certain decisions, but they might be able to make them in different circumstances or and not to influence or, as you say, mislead either intentionally or unintentionally. So it's a very difficult area, of course, really. Um, mm. I think we're probably way to, to begin. I think everyone's sort of logged on and we're, we're okay to, to start. Right. So I'm just going to say, uh, just to say welcome to everybody who's joined us for this uh, watch along of A Good Man Goes to War. Um, either people might watch watching live or on YouTube uh, later on. 
I'm delighted to be joined by Simon Fisher Becker, who plays um, Dorium in this, uh, and what a wonderful character Dorium is as, as well. Um, some of um, uh, your credits include uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, or Sorcerer's Stone, depending on which side of the, uh, of the pond uh, you happen to be. Um, what, uh, One Foot in the Grave, Les Miserables, uh, the 2012 version. Is there any other credits, Simon, that you'd like to add to, to that list? Oh, I'm so old, I've been in everything, really. I, you know, like every actor, I've been in the bill. Uh, I've, been, I've been in Doctors as well on television. I did various films. Some went straight to video. Others did went round on the circuit. Some are shown on BBC Two every now and then. Uh, so the answer is to go to my IMDB page. Oh, yeah. And, and your website as well. And there's my website as well, which is fisherbecker.info. So, uh, and they can find all sorts of things there as well. Yeah, I had a look at it uh, later on, on today, and yes, it's got some very nice sort of uh, bits and pieces. So I recommend people people check check them out. And we were talking obviously about uh, um, some of your books and things, but again, probably we'll touch that. Probably we'll touch on your writing as we go through the uh, the, the episode. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin with uh, the prequel to A Good Man Goes to War. Which is only just going to be one or, one or two minutes, and some people may have that in front of them. If if you don't, um, uh, it's not going to make too much of a difference. Just have a general conversation about it. Um, so I'm just going to get that on my DVD now. Are you ready to play the prequel, Simon? I am. Just tell me when to say go. So I'll do a countdown for five. So five, four, three, two, one, play. So Simon, was this always pitched to you as, as a prequel, or was this actually just a, a, a scene that was ended up uh, changed? No, no uh, they came to me whilst we were about half past five one evening hmm. uh, and said, uh, Stephen, the thing was, Stephen was wondering if you'd uh, like to do a trailer hmm. for this episode. So of course I said, yes, uh, it will be you and three other characters. Hmm. And of course, they didn't tell me that the other characters were mute. Yeah. It wasn't until I got the script at 11 o'clock that evening mm. that I found out it was a monologue. Yeah. Um, and it's just very nice you, that you were sent the centre of, of, of this little, um, you say, a teaser. And, it's, and it does obviously come relevant in the episode as well, doesn't it? Besides the technology that... Yeah, I'm, I'm having difficulty hearing you. Hang on. You now? Can you hear me okay this now, Simon? You got me? Can you hear me okay? All right, that's better. You got me now? Yeah. So, so I was just sort of saying, um, because obviously the people does set up um, just come into into play later on in the episode, doesn't it? Was saying the yes, it was it was a concept they came up with for that series only, I think. Hmm. Um, uh, and I thought they worked very well, and uh, I've had a lot of response to the prequel, especially the one I did. Hmm. Uh, but it was it was it was just very funny because I wasn't thinking about it at all. I was just sitting on my chair. I can't even think where I was on the studio, um, and uh, you know, this uh, uh, lady came up to me and just said, "Oh, Stephen." said, would you like to do the trailer? Thinking it was going to be a trailer for the show. Hmm. Yeah. You know, coming up, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it was very funny. And um, and apparently he, at half past five, he was still writing it. Oh, uh, and and uh, she said, it'll be in your trailer when you finish tonight. And we finished around 11 o'clock. Hmm. And... Um, and of course, the first thing I did was I opened the brown envelope and there it was, and I realised it was this monologue. Hmm. So it was a bit of a sleepless night <laughs> yeah. uh, because they were filming at nine o'clock the following morning. Hmm. But uh, uh, such is lovey dum really. But um, it, it came out very well. I'm very pleased with it. Yeah, uh, a little, little scene, isn't it? And obviously because you you had your background of theatre and you're quite used to doing sort of holding scenes on, on, on your on your own and, and obviously learning dialogue that is perhaps not the easiest to to do so sort of play to your strengths in, in a way. Well it, it did play to my strengths but uh, I have to say um, 
uh, Mr. Moffat's uh, dialogue for Dorian was excellent. And uh, uh, a, a lot of actors uh, or students in particular ask, how do I go about learning my lines? And all I can say is, the first thing you should do is try and understand what you're saying. Mm. And because there are some projects that you think, oh, what the, what the hell are they talking about here? Yeah. You know, or or if you're doing something uh, like um, uh, like a Shakespeare uh, or a Moliere, then uh, it, sometimes the language that is used is a bit confusing compared to today's language. And so trying to analyze what you're actually saying mm. can be a bit more difficult to some. Um, but that's what I say. If you actually understand what you're saying, then it does make it easier. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. To learn, and it was when I think about it, it was only what? How long was it? Less than two minutes. Yeah, minute, minute and a half. Yeah, I yeah. Think. Um, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, um, and so I should have been able to learn it quite quickly, but with the the fact that the, the whole day before was quite heavy, mm. and I'm tired anyway, and then the panic that you're on the stage at nine o'clock, which means they're going to call you in at half past seven, if you're lucky. Uh, there's all that going on. But it, it worked very well. But to, to add to the, um, to the, uh, of the whole experience, uh, they, they were also filming the Doctor Who Confidentials. Oh, that yeah. Ran at the time. And, <clears throat> and the, somebody came up to me, she said, oh, she said, I'm the director of the Confidentials. Uh, do you mind if we ask you a few questions? And I said, oh, yes, no problem. I'm, I'm sure we'll be done soon. She said, oh, no, we can do it between takes. <laughs> so every time they they uh, they did a take and they had to change a light bulb or whatever, um, then they insist that they had to sort of dab my blue and make sure I'm aware. So I've got people attending to my costume, attending to my blue pack and everything. And then this will then ask you me questions. And the way they did it is that the audience didn't hear the question from the interviewer. So you had to answer it by sort of giving the question as well. And there was all that going on, plus trying to keep in the head the lines that I'd only learnt overnight. Yeah. It was, uh, but I think it's on reflection in some ways that, <laughs> it was it was very bizarre, but uh, it, it actually helped relax me a bit more. I I, I found this uh, I found this in things like pantomime. Mm -hmm. it, I found uh, being dame or ugly sister means you've got costume changes and goodness knows what else, and so you're sort of more for focus and things go on, and there isn't time to be too nervous because you're focused on what's going on. Whereas if you're in a smaller role and you've got half an hour before you actually make your first entrance, that's the time that makes you jittery and nervous and panicky. Mm. And then, then you forget what your first line is. Yeah, yeah. So that was very similar to that. Mm. <laughs> and add to that, at one point, um, uh, Karen Gillian was in the space, sitting down waiting to do something else in the same space. So she was there watching and observing. Uh, and the wonderful Frances Barber turned up as well. Because yeah. at the same time, she was going to do, I think, one of her peekaboo uh, oh. scenes as Madame Kavara. I don't know what it was at the time, but she was there. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, they're all watching. And <laughs> well, there we go. But it was very good experience. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm. Uh, it's had a huge response. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, yeah, I, I, it just uh, it's a special thing for the fans as well, which is always good. Oh yeah, 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 it's perfect. It's a lovely thing too. And it's, obviously, it's a shame they don't do them any anymore. As we said, I, I assume it's just sort of, sort of budget constraints that don't allow them to sort of do, uh, you know, because obviously they they got rid of Doctor Who confidential and all that sort of thing. So I think the money, if you look at it, I think it's always yes. I, I don't know why, because the prequel thing, in in fact, I thought worked extremely well. But um, but and I'm lucky to have been part of that. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so we're now set up the main episode then. So uh, I'll just get make sure we just just go just give everybody a few seconds just to get on to the episode that itself, uh, and then I'll then I'll do another another countdown. So you set up with the um, episode. I'm all I'm all set up. Okay, lovely. Okay, so. 
five, four, three, two, one, play. So this week, yes, so we so now start with the pre to sleep. Okay. Um, so one thing I wanted to, to point out, Simon, is obviously your first appearance in Dot Hill was obviously the Pandora Opens, which aired um, obviously in 2011, and to be precise, the 19th of June 2011. So without us realising it, we are exactly um, 11 years since your first appearance. Yeah. To the actual day, which I, which I, I thought yes. was quite astonishing. It, it, um, well, because the first thing I did was the Pandorica Opens. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and and at that point, that was all Dora was going to do. Hmm. Uh, so and then it was exactly a year later. So that was in 2010, January, I filmed that. And then in January 2011 is when we filmed this. Right. Okay. And then then I was called a couple of months later to do the, the wedding of uh, River Song. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so you say it was just designed to be um, a, a one-off. So, what was it like to get the call back? Oh, it was extraordinary because you know I'm a Doctor Who fan, mm. and as much as I really enjoyed being Dorham in the Pandorica Opens, the idea that it was the only thing was a little disappointing. So, yeah. to be called back again mm. was very exciting. And uh, Matt Smith, in particular, welcomed me with open arms and hugged me. Yeah, which was uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, and then the kid inside me was thinking, oh, my God, the doctor's hugging me. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a... And then when they asked me back a couple of months later, even my agent said, well, I don't know what you're doing, she said, but they want you back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah and what so, do you remember about the doing the Pandora Opens? Because obviously you have a lovely scene with uh, yeah. Kingston, what was she yes. like to work with in that? And, um, yeah. Yeah, that was extraordinary because we it was filmed down in the bowels of Cardiff in a wine bar, mm -hmm. and this and the space was tiny. Yeah. Uh, because but of course they still insist of having camera men sound uh, sound camera uh, costume makeup <laughs> plus the extras, mm -hmm. uh, the directors and the producers. It was. Uh, Extraordinary, but it was it was good fun, and Alex Kingston was lovely. I was terrified, of course, uh, but and she has the most fascinating eyes. Oh, yeah, she does, isn't she? Yeah. And I just wanted to run my fingers through her hair. I'm sure there's a few Doctor Who fans who would feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, so would you have got the? Because obviously, this script has a has quite a, a cliffhanger. Uh, to it, um, how much would you have known of, say, the last sort of ten minutes of of this episode? Would you have got uh, an alternate ending, or would it, the script? I got end? a couple. I, I got a call, and it was a few weeks. It was a couple of weeks before Christmas, and then I went through a read through in the first or second week of January. Yeah. And then we were filming it uh, towards the end of January. That was the sort of notice period. Yeah. And of course, the ending in my script was very different from the ending that you all got to watch. Right. Yeah. Do you remember roughly what how it sort of ended in, in the script? Sorry, sorry. Do you, remember, do you remember roughly how your script ended? How the, how it was you different? know I was talking I was talking to Francis Barber the other day and we both can't remember because we both had different endings. Oh right. Yeah. In fact it, it turned out that every script had a different ending. Hmm. Uh, uh, but uh, and when it came to the read through, we didn't actually read that bit, and I oh. thought it was I thought it was a bit odd, but I now know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, what did you think of the finished episode when you saw it? Um... Well, when the when the twist came, it was fantastic. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that, uh, that Melanie uh, that uh, Miss Pond. Is uh, River Song's mother? Mm. Yeah, and you know Arthur Darvo. He's a he's an unsung hero. You know, he's a very quiet, reserved person by nature. Yeah, but he's utterly, utterly delightful. And some of the th things he does, including in this uh, in this episode, are very subtle. I, I really 
I really appreciated what he does. Yeah. Um, do you have any memories of the director, Peter Peter Holler? Um, anything about working with him? Yeah. yeah. So, do you remember um, the director, uh, Peter Holler, right, Simon? Yes, uh, Peter Holler's uh, very, very, very funny. Uh, I, I remember... Well, I've got so many stories to tell him, really. Uh, we did the read-through. Uh, we did the read-through, and afterwards, he sort of made this grand gesture. He said, if anybody wants to talk about their character or, or whatever, uh, just to contact him. Hmm. And, and of course, uh, <laughs> you could never get hot cold of him because he was too busy. So I, I wrote an email to him hmm. with a few suggestions. And I got no response, and I thought, oh, well, there we go. I've made the suggestions, and that's it. But when we came to filming the scene with Madame Kavarian, yeah. which will be coming up soon, I think, um, and when I sat down at this uh, this table, and this props man came out, and he said, there you go, Dorian, there's your box. And one of the suggestions I made was that uh, Dorian would have money or something that he's playing with whilst he's uh, talking to Madame Kavarian. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I opened up the box and there you go. Hmm. Uh, there was all this money type things to play with. I also made the suggestion that somebody would point a gun at Dorian oh, and yeah. he would just push it away dismissively. And of course, that's what happened. And I thought, oh, blimey. Not only did they see my email, but they took up a couple of points. Okay. Oh, yeah. And uh, and also, when it came to the costume fitting hmm. of um, for uh, the Pandorica opens, yeah, the chain that Dorum had around his neck with the crescent shaped symbols, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. just happened to be in a box at the costume place. And I picked that up and I said, oh, I like that. And then I found that, that the Moldavarian, its logo is the Crescent Moon. So I'd like to think that I had some influence there. I have no idea whether I did or not. But, uh, yeah. I mean, it's nice they were open to, to your suggestions and they were incorporating um, it all. So that sounds like a, a nice atmosphere. Yes. Uh, we all like to think we have an influence over something, but to be honest, you, you just don't know. It may have only been coincidence. Who knows? Did you have quite a lengthy audition for, for, for Dory, or did they come No, to it literally was uh, in and out in five minutes. Yeah. We was, I was sent the script, which was effectively the, so, the, the scene with River Song. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, asked to deliver it in three different ways. I was also asked to flirt with the casting director's assistant because right. they wanted Dorum to be a bit of a flirt as well. And that was it. And um, I was one of seven people that they saw. Hmm. Uh, and I was thinking or hoping for a recall. But instead, uh, two or three days later, I got the call to say I've got it. Which is, wow. well, in fact, the call went, can I speak to the large blue intergalactic black marketeer from Doctor Who? So that's, <laughs> that's how I knew I got it. And, of course, I was bouncing around like Tigger for the rest of the day yeah. when I had the call. Yeah. Yeah. So I take it, normally auditions, you get maybe a call back, another call back. So it, sometimes it was, it was quite um, drawn out auditions. I mean, normally I would expect would have expected, uh, well, nine. Uh, I would say four times out of five, uh, I would get a recall, mm. and then I would either get it or not after that. Yeah. Uh, but in this case, it was just a straight off off uh, after the first audition, which was excellent. So and then you... things changed changed quite dramatically for me. Oh right. Yeah. In that. Um, for a, a number of years after I first appeared, I didn't have to audition at all. I was just asked for my availability. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but there we go. And do you like... So, um, that's, the, that's the power of television. Yeah. Do you like the audition process? Is it something that 
that you enjoy doing or because I know some actors don't like or, or uh, I I uh... It's a mixture of feelings, really. It's the thought, oh, God, it's another audition. But then uh, I quite liked doing auditions. Hmm. It used to be soul-destroying sometimes because you'd turn up and you think, oh, no, this isn't really for me. Hmm. Uh, and, and when you get that frame of mind, uh, it can so easily uh, you not do an audition properly. But although it might not be suitable, that director and producer might, if you do a good job, think you and have you in mind for another project. Hmm. So you should always take things seriously. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think Dorian's going to make his entrance soon. I think we're very, 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 very soon. So oh, we're yes. Doing yeah. one for um, Alex Kingston um, at the moment. Yeah. But, um, yes, I, uh, yes, it was the thing. I had to audition for anything and everything. Uh, uh, but then I was getting uh, more opportunities where people were just asking my availability, which I have to confess is brilliant and fantastic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I like the whole process, uh, to be honest. And uh, you got to learn to build a thick skin. Oh, yeah. Uh, because, you know, you go up for an audition and you don't get it. It's so easy to fall into the mindset, oh, you must have been crap. Whereas, yeah. in fact, you weren't crap at all. Mm. It's just that for whatever reason, they chose someone else. Mm. Yeah. The only time I get annoyed is if I see somebody my age group and my size and shape, yeah. and I didn't actually go for an audition, uh, then I'd get a bit pissed off and I'd say, well, why didn't I get called for that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, you then look into it and you find that you were put forward, but you just weren't chosen. Hmm. It's like anything in life, isn't it? It's being at the right place at the right time. It's not necessarily about being good or bad. It's you know, no, because uh, the producers and directors have got uh, have got other things in mind, and will you fit in with this, that, and the other? And uh, hmm. I will admit that if if you look like if you look like what they're um, looking for then mm. you're bound to be offered it oh yeah but yeah. Uh, but I, I can also say in i've been offered work where i definitely did not look like what they had in mind so it, it's difficult to say really oh yeah yeah, yeah. um so would yeah. it perhaps when you got Harry Potter again, was, was that, uh, I imagine that might have been quite a long audition process. Oh, that was a nightmare. Four, four auditions I had to go to. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, I think Dorham's coming oh, up. Yeah, so yeah. we'll, we'll watch this bit and then I'll go on and I'll tell you about the here we go. Yes, a good use of props coming up. Um, so yeah, I made your, your suggestion about the guns, yeah. Yeah, I don't think, it, as you said, I don't think it would have worked if we didn't have the the, the main account, because obviously it keeps part of the energy, isn't it, of the of the scene and the character as well. Yes. I loved uh, working with uh, Francis Barber on that scene. Mm. I was uh, because I'm a big fan of Francis Barber, mm. 
Uh, I've known her work for years, so I was terrified. <laughs> Although it looked like Dora was in charge inside, I was quaking and quaking and quivering. Uh, but it um, it was really fun. It's a lovely laugh you do when she when she leaves because you know she's obviously yeah. way out of her depth, or so it seems. Yeah. Um, what was most of Dora on 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 the, the page in terms of the? the the dialogue, or again, would you have sort of flavoured that as well? Well, um, when I did the audition uh, uh, and the, the scene with River Song, it was very simple. It um, it just said Dorium. It was Dorium. It didn't even have a surname, first of all. It was just Dorium. Right. Uh, Dorium. Uh, large blue man thinks Sydney Green Street. Yeah. Now, Sydney Green Street was an English actor who went out to America. Uh, to appear to star in films after he retired <laughs> being a bank manager or something like that. Hmm. Uh, but he was a very large man and he was in a film called Casablanca, which is one of my favourite films. Yeah. And he plays uh, Senor Fer uh, Ferrari, who is very much a Dorium. He was a black marketeer. So I knew exactly what Stephen Moffat had in mind. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't going to do an impersonation of Sydney Green Street, but I knew exactly that. Uh, mm. So that helped. It, it also said, um, set a homage to Star Wars. So it gave me exactly what it was gonna look like. And I say now to uh, drama students who are also thinking of being doing writing is for an actor to have very simple and concise notes and instructions makes it a lot easier. There's so many scripts you get, and you get two and a half pages of waffle, and it actually says nothing. You know, well, large blue man, basically, <laughs> on a Star Wars set. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then when you, when you look into it, and clearly the exchanges he had with um, uh, River Song, he was a uh, duplicitous. He was he was a multi layered character, and I clocked that very quickly. Uh, and of course, then Stephen Moffat weaved that into the dialogue for for this the Good Man Goes to War, uh, and so I think that's what's caught the fans' imagination. Is he a goodie? Is he a baddie? We don't really know. Yes, it is ambiguous in, in, in that respect. And and I I love that in a character, you know, mm. and to be able to and to have had the opportunity to uh, to run with it. Uh, Excellent. And I honestly, I know I'm in this episode, but I do think this episode in particular is the best one of the series. Yeah. Because I, there was so much in it, so, so much in 48 minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I find it quite interesting watching it earlier today about how religion is, is, is in, in the future, how it's, how it's adapted, how it's become as a papal mainframe and it's, and it's, Science, technology, plus religion. It's quite an interesting. Um, this, well, Stephen Moffat's very good, isn't he? Have, have, have these these very interesting concepts and turning yes. things ahead. Um, and again, much like the season series five final, it brings back lots of you know yeah. of characters from the from early on in the in the, uh, in the season. So it, it, yes, you say it's awful lot in there in that 48 minutes yes um, and the headless monks again very interesting concept as well isn't yes it? um i mean the very sort of tongue-in-cheek look at religion without being disrespectful or anything of anything like that really um So if you enjoyed Dan um, playing uh, Dorian on, on, in, in with Big Finish and be able to explore a bit more of of his um, his story. Oh, oh, sorry, Simon. I just wanted to know if you um, enjoyed playing Dorian in in Big Finish and to, to examine. Well, that. yes, the the. Uh... Uh, the 11th Doctor Chronicles with Big Finish 
it was really it was really a Dorian story with the Doctor. So uh, it was excellent. Um, uh, alas, it wasn't Matt Smith, but it was the wonderful Jacob Dubman, mm. who was brilliant as Matt Smith, but he's also brilliant uh, uh, as David Tennant, and he did a very good Peter Capaldi as well. So uh, it was wonderful working with him. Mm. And there were times, and we were standing, or sitting opposite each other on the other opposite side of the studios and there were the times I had to look up because he really sounded so much like Matt Smith it was unbelievable um but it, it was very good because the fan every day or every week shall I say fans say is Dorian coming back and of course mm. and the standard answer is absolutely true I have no idea I've let it be known that I would return in a heartbeat if I was asked and that my bank manager would encourage it incredibly. Uh, but um, it's up to the powers that be, isn't it, really? So, um, I know yes. Um, sorry, go on, Simon. No, I was just going to say, well, so whatever it is that the fans are hooked on mm. for Dorum, I'm count, I'm, I count myself very lucky. It's extraordinary. I mean, you pointed out it's 11 years ago, nearly, or 10 years ago that we were actually filming this stuff. And I've still got people uh, interested in me and Dorham and what I have to offer. Mm. And I find that quite remarkable. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I thought it was remarkable. I, I, you know, I, I said at the beginning, the timing of, of, of our event today, because it, it is literally 11, 11 years to the day this um, Pandora Crocans was, was forecast. On 19th of was it today? Uh, I thought it was the 4th of June, but I could be wrong. Oh, uh, well, oh, this, this, this one we're watching now. Oh, uh, the one we're watching now, yes. Uh, but Pandorka opens your first ever appearance. Yes. 11 years ago, exactly, and probably at 7 o'clock when we started. So, yes. <laughs> we did well, it like that. Yeah, isn't that extraordinary? Yeah. But, uh, uh, we, we, pretend we, we pretend we designed it that way, shall we? Yes. Yeah. It's always best, always the best, and maybe subconsciously it, it, it was designed that way. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, well, I, but perhaps it might have been some sort of yeah. something in, in in the brain that went, "Oh, yes, we should look, look, look at this in June," sort of thing. Um, yeah. what, what was it like to work with uh, with Matt Smith then? Sorry. What was it like to work with Matt Smith? Well, Matt Smith was utterly delightful, but as was the whole team, really. I mean, when I was there, it was very much like a family. And at the, at the head, you had, um, I wouldn't, a strict is the wrong word, but a, a sort of father figure who was definitely in charge. And he was perfectly fine as long as you turned up knowing your lines and you did your job, hmm. you know, uh, and, and it was a joy, really. Uh, Matt Smith, uh, we became more and more pally. And in the um, uh, wedding song, the river, uh, the, the wedding of River Song, yeah. that time it was just him and me together. Hmm. So he would come by my trailer and chat. It was very funny because my the, the design of my trailer was that he was quite high and he'd walk past and all I'd see is his shoulders and his head. Hmm. <laughs> and then he'd put his arms up. Go morning, Sai. How are you? So everybody was very friendly. Uh, the visiting artists were a little, a little uh, cautious, like we, like always, because you know, until you really get to know everybody, you are an outsider, sort of thing. Yeah. But uh, no, there was no problems at all. Very professional. Mm. You know, I can't say otherwise, really. And obviously, Karen, Karen, Gill Karen Gillan has obviously gone on to massive stardom with, with Marvel films and yes. various things. Um, what was she like to, to work with uh, at that point in her career? Well, I did. We were the only scene in Bertie Commas that uh, I can say I was with was uh, was in the sort of battle sequence, and I but I didn't actually get to uh, to be with her or chat with her properly. Hmm. Uh, I mean, we it was a polite hello. Let's get on with it, really. Hmm. And then she was off. I mean, the main the main characters. I mean, 
Matt, of course, Karen and, and Arthur, you know, they were the three main characters. And so, you know, in between filming scenes, they were off signing things or doing interviews or whatever. The pressures uh, uh, are quite demanding and they did it with, uh, with charm. And yet there must have been times, I mean, fatigue alone. I remember filming the head in the box. Yeah. Um, uh, Matt had just come back from New York. And so his body clock was all over the place. Mm. And yet he turned up on time, knew his lines, got on with things. Yeah, yeah I think there was massive pressure on, on Matt Smith and then... Um... Yeah. And then Peter Capaldi, I think Peter Capaldi had to do a world tour, including Australia and all sorts of things. And um, that's probably why nobody plays the Doctor for more than three years these days. Because well, because it, it, it's quite extraordinary. I, I mean, the story is that uh, William Hartnell had to give up because he was poorly. Mm. And he was, but it turns out he had, uh, today, the, the condition he had, they were just, uh, you know... Um, a course of antibiotics and he would have been fine but they were sort of they were sort of do uh, 30 or 40 episodes a year yeah yeah and i know talking to uh, fraser hines uh, i mean uh, again during patrick chalton's time they just it just got exhausting they needed a break they just needed even if it was just a week hmm. Because the pressure, the added pressures there was uh, sometimes in the early time, some scenes were live, so you got that pressure. Yeah. And they didn't know one week to the next whether there was going to be next week. Well, yeah, that's right, yeah. But the only difference then was they, they did rehearse, mm. whereas now, uh, you know, rehearsing is, uh, there is a degree of rehearsal, but it's really what you can and what you can muster as you go along. Yeah. So a group of actors will get to do other and do word runs. Mm. Then you get on the set and there'll be a technical run, really, but that's just to make sure the cameras can be in the right place and the lights are in the right place and the sound and blah, blah, blah. And uh, and so in many ways, the actors are an afterthought, which is quite ironic. Yeah. Um, and so that's the only time you get to rehearse as such. Hmm. But uh, I remember many years ago, I did an episode of uh, One Foot in the Grave, oh, yeah. and we had a week's rehearsal. Oh, wow, yeah. It was one, and we had a week's rehearsal. And, and that's absolute luxury nowadays. And, and so unless it's a, a particularly special scene in whatever project you're doing, there's, there's very rarely now is there actual rehearsal time. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I imagine there's a noticeable difference in having that week's rehearsal so one foot in the grave you can sort of I imagine later yeah things. I mean when you do stage plays and things you do in your rehearsal period is where you do find your character properly and you can fine tune things with television in particular you just have to come up with an idea that everybody will like straight away hmm. you know I mean sometimes you are given. You are asked to give options, so they'll do two or three takes, but you have to make sure that each take is different. So, in other words, you have one take, mm. you know, for each variant that you offer. But you you get you soon get used to it. When when it first happened to me, I, my eyes were wide open. It was definitely rabbit <laughs> rabbit eyes in the lights because you're thinking, what the? Because you, you see, this one thing you're taught at college. You need to discuss the character and you need to blah, blah, blah. And yes, you do, but it, there's no such thing now and unless you happen to bump into whoever needs to discuss it with you, you know, at, at, uh, at the water tower, you know. And, um, or if they, if they choose to come to you and talk. Hmm. But, uh, I mean, uh, what was it? I remember Stephen Moffat asking me if I would object to having my head shaved. Yes. And and, uh, and and of course you don't. It's Doctor Who. You say the word "no" isn't in the vocabulary. Uh, and he was explaining that with HD, um, skull caps look like skull caps. 
yeah. Right. Uh, but the irony is when they shave my head, the back of my head looks like the backside of a moon, you know, and uh, uh, so it looked like I was wearing a skull cap anyway. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but uh, as I said earlier, I was lucky. The writing alone gave me an idea of what Dorian is like. Mm. Yeah, know. I think Stephen Moffat has an incredible mind, well, for any writer does, but some of the, the wibbly wobbly, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff, yeah. that, that, you know, that's it's now a, you know, a, quite a, a famous phrase in Doctor, Doctor Who world. It's sort of, yeah. think, to think those 12, 15 steps ahead and to, Yes, you know, it, it's difficult watching it. Let you know to try and make it sense in your mind, but to actually write it down and have that kind of plan. Uh, I was I was also very lucky with the cast. Um, I mean, uh, Francis Barber is delightful. Mm -hmm. uh, Neve McIntosh, very funny, very funny. Mm -hmm. um, Caitlin Stewart, delightful. Christina. I can't remember what was it, Christina Thong, Thong, Tong, uh, Christina Tong. Yeah, uh, she was lovely too, and we we offset. We were very friendly, and Dan Starkey, of course. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, there were a few scenes that Dan Starkey and I did some improvisation on, but it was it was not taken up, right? Which is a shame, but but we all had a good time. Hmm. which helped oh yeah and it was amazing how we would have a bit of banter whilst we're waiting and then suddenly you'd hear people say right okay right <laughs> stand by and we all suddenly went hmm. you yeah. know but it was um yeah so would have there been um any any uh, scenes you would have shot that would have then been been cut out that you would call on Doctor Who? Well, I'm very lucky that most of the stuff I did, mm. particularly with the dialogue wise, most of it is kept in. Yeah. About this scene now. Mm. Yeah, it was a. Because again, your scenes were were very integral in terms of moving the plot along. So. Yes. You know, taking out if, if they wanted to, you know, it was very sort of, yeah. And, uh, but uh, it is very life well, it's like for everybody, really. You go to college and you train for your profession, mm -hmm. but it's not until you actually get out there and get the job that you actually learn about your profession. Yeah. And it's exactly the same for actors and performers, particularly in television and film. Um, in some ways, I would argue that everything I was taught. I've not actually yet experienced. Oh, right. <laughs> but what it does do is give you a good grounding. Mm. And you have to, as much as possible, it's difficult at times, particularly when you get a script late, that uh, having it under your belt as best you can when you're on the set is really important because sometimes, and this happened with another production I did, was, um, another production was... Um, Oh, what's it, what was it called? Going on. Hmm. It was set, set in in the NHS. It was Joe Brand and uh, Joe Scanlon and Vicky Pepperdine uh, set in the hospital. We were doing everything, and everything was running the hunky dory. And then they said, "Oh, we can't do the next scene. Do you think we could do the scene two scenes down?" Hmm. Now, as it happens, that scene was with me, and it was very technical. Uh, dialogue and so I'd learnt that first right. so I was ready so I say to everybody whatever script you're given mm. make sure you know everything on day one yeah because although they have a schedule sometimes something will happen and you don't stick to it mm. but um where are we now this we must be getting very close now to the revelation oh yes yeah we are yes it's starting to um yeah that was my favorite line it does make sense you can't just cook a time lord yeah, that's a good line. Um, I think one of one of my favourite lines of the episode um, is coming up, and again, it's one of your lines. Uh, five minutes um, when the when the monks start to close in and, and they start to chant, and yes, you say, um, oh my God, it's the the attack prayer. Yeah. Uh, 
Ah, well, now the story of the attack prayer hmm. in a, in an early version of the script, there was reference to Dorian's mother, who was a composer, and she and she wrote the attack prayer. Oh, so knowing that hmm. gave the the uh, gave the impetus, you know, that that's why Dorian recognised it. Oh, good God, it's the attack prayer. Oh, I see. So, um, yeah. had I not had that little little nugget, yeah, I might have delivered that line differently. Yeah, mm. but uh, it's a lovely delivery and a, a wonderful line. So, yeah, it um, uh, yes, it was um, because I then thought to myself, well, if she is a composer, does that mean Dorium is musical in some sort of way? Mm. And I, I sort of contemplated what musical instrument we might play. And of course, I thought the obvious choice would be a euphonium or a tuba, but then conversely, it could be a piccolo. Yeah. <laughs> but in the end, I plumped that he was a conductor. Because oh, yeah. uh, he himself pulls strings and controls things. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. We're coming to the revelation soon, aren't we? We are indeed, yeah. yeah. Doing that force field sequence was such fun. Hmm. Because of course there was no force field there. <laughs> yeah. Again, is it is it does it take a while to get used to working like that? Where you've got something you can't see, the visual effects. Is, are you? I know that's where mime comes in. You see, hmm. um, and of course we filmed this. It was about two or three o'clock in the morning. It, it was in an aircraft hangar uh, at an RAF base right. somewhere in Wales. Mm. And it was a January freezing cold because it had been snowing. Ah. <laughs> yeah. This is... There's a wonderful emotion, isn't there, in, in Stephen, Stephen Moffat's writing? There's so much. Well, I think I think it's also, um, and it's a thing that uh, that I like about Doctor Who. Yeah. Uh, is that you can have comedy moments followed by. Some... Oh, here we go. This is my. Yeah. So, what was your opinion when you when you read this? The, the scene. Were you, were you happy with, with well, in fate here? Yeah. It, it it was um, of course I was excited that I was brought back, and then to find a, uh, that I lose my head, uh, I did think, oh, mm. oh, there we go. So when they called me back for a third time, yeah, I thought it was going to do with his backstory. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's what I thought, but of course I never expected. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But I think as a scene, it, I think it's. Um, I mean, do you think that that, that his death scene does complement the, the, the character? It's sort of true to his, his character. Well, see, it's Doctor Who. Anything can happen. You see, I. Because I I always say that Dorian wouldn't have handed over the vortex manipulator without having tried it. So yeah. that it leaves you open, you know. Anyway, yeah. I I need to just I need to step out for just a oh, couple of minutes. Sure. Yeah, I was just get we've just paused the uh, the video and then we'll come back uh, when you're ready, Simon. That's, that's yeah, fine. it's it's just for a comfort break. Oh yeah, yeah, I think I might have one as well. So that's absolutely yep. fine. Okay, see you shortly.
Okay, so just waiting for Simon to, uh, to, to return. So if anybody's got any questions in the meantime that you want to uh, me to then ask Simon when he gets back, please do put it in the, in the chat and uh, we'll resume shortly. So I hope everyone's enjoying the, uh, the evening so far. Okay, Simon. Hello, I'm back. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. Okay, lovely. So uh, we'll we'll get started again. So I'll, I'll do another countdown from five. Uh, right. two, five, four, three, two, one, play. So the, the scene that we're seeing now, obviously, it was. It must be quite nice to be with to have Dan Starkey, Matt Smith, Arthur Davil. Yes. Would um, so how long would, would roughly be the episode taken to to, to, to shoot and, and these scenes in particular? Well, it, it, it's filmed on a ten day fortnight, <clears throat> mm -hmm. so that's that's how how they work. Yeah. So it's very quick, mm. and with so much to do in one episode, uh, you know that's another reason why they like you to be on top of your words because really uh, <laughs> you know something technical might go wrong uh, but but uh, uh, so you have to be well without being too great you have to be perfect every take hmm. yeah because <laughs> because because uh, you know because sometimes and I think every actor will say there have been certain projects they've done um that um there's some projects though they, they've been on that the take that was chosen wasn't necessarily their best take yeah but technically it was and tech and technical stuff overrides any other anything else hmm. but once you accept that you get you have an enjoyable time oh. and there is this challenge particularly for english actors they rather like to sort of try and get something done in one take. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, I think this next bit section that's coming up is brilliant and is done brilliantly well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, uh, I wasn't part of this scene, of course. Yeah. But... Um, uh, it's just wonderful to see, and like I say you just you just watch uh, what Arthur Darvill does as well. Mm. I think it's excellent stuff. He's very subtle. He is. Isn't he? So, would you have been allowed to watch any any, any filming of other scenes or? Um, well, because this is all done in the uh, air around, so I was around. Hmm. So I was watching from afar. Yeah. And of course, things are filmed out of sequence. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but it was, it, it was, uh, I had a wonderful time. I, and I can't, uh, can't deny that at all. Yeah. And it did a lot of good for me. Hmm. <laughs> and thanks to the fans, uh, it's helped me get through uh, lockdown. <clears throat> oh, yeah. So that's yeah. that's another reason why I like to do things like this, mm. just to say, you know, I appreciate the fans. Yeah, it's always nice when the actors, you know, to do, you know, are, are accessible and and they acknowledge, you know, not that not that they have to, of course, but it's, it's always nice when they want to give some something back, and it's um, 
you know, obviously the fans appreciate it as well. Yeah. Because you, you do like going to conventions, so you do like that. I, I do like going to conventions, because after all, I sort of joke that I need to thank the fans for my new bathroom. <laughs> Because Stephen Moffat has subsequently told me that he wanted to do more with Dorian, but wasn't sure. Hmm. So in the back of his mind, he was going to bring Dorian back. But it was the response from the fans, from the Pandorica Opens, yeah. that encouraged him to find something. So whatever I did, whatever I did with <laughs> Dorian in the Pandorica Opens, that hmm. caught the fans immediately. Oh, we're coming. We're going to come up to the revelation now. Yeah. We're, and you just watch Arthur Darville when it, when it, he turns out he's the father. <laughs> he does a very subtle movement. I I do respect him as an actor. Mm. I think that's one thing that that. Um say the Jodie Whittaker, Doctor Who kind of misses, is that, is that the emotion side of, uh, of Doctor Who. It doesn't seem to be as, uh, as moving and as stirring emotionally as it did when either um, Rusty Davis or Stephen Moffat. Well, I, I, I can't comment on that really. Uh, but uh, I mean, it is very interesting watching back-to-back -back episodes from Christopher Eccleston through mm. that you can, uh, I mean, you have to give it you you have to give it to Matt Smith. David Tennant was a big actor follow. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think he was excellent. And of course I'll say that. But I really do. And he was a, he was he was a lovely chap to work with as well. Hmm. And Alex Kingston, they're utterly delightful, really. In in my opinion, my experience, I didn't experience any divas as such hmm. mark gatis absolutely lovely chap to to work with as well i think what, what was nice is that that, that mark yeah. and steven it's, and russell were big doctor who found as well which i think obviously helped the uh their approach to it i think the actors who are doctor who fans uh, do bring a little extra hmm to it, uh, I, I will say that. Because yeah. you can't imagine, I've watched it since William Hartnell. Uh, I was two when it all started, oh, but, yeah. I, but I was about five and about to turn six mm. when Patrick Troughton came along. Mm. So, uh, so I followed Doctor Who and I'm a big, uh, I'd say I was a follower. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Here we go, we must come to this, you just, yeah. Because <laughs> again, you, you would assume that Stephen had this in his head from the songs for, for first. I'd day. like, I, I suspect he had something like very much like this in his head from the beginning. Mm. But there you've got the combination of something very serious and a comedy moment, and then it's becoming serious again. Yeah. It's very good. And here it all comes. It's, it's a quite extraordinary. And of course, there was a lot of hype for this episode because it was it was um, a mid-season final. I think it was how it was advertised. So it was in, yeah. like a you know a season yeah. final for all intents and purposes. So did did you feel that at the time and when it was leading up to the broadcast that there was a lot of excitement about this particular episode? And uh, yes, I mean we knew when we read it that it was a good episode anyway. Hmm. But as for the revelation, nobody knew what it was going to be apart from those who are in the scene. Yeah. And this is this is the revelation now. Mm. I remember thinking, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so 
So I assume that Patrick Troughton was was your doctor and still is. Well, I I I think of him as my doctor, and of course Matt is my special doctor. Mm. Yeah. What Arthur Devil now? Mm. <laughs> I still applaud that. I know. Sorry, it makes me sound very childish, but. Uh, yeah. And there's a very good, subtle, it's yeah. in, in his performance. Very good. Did you still watch um, Doctor Who now? You still? Yes, I, I still do. I still do. Um, I was talking to somebody in Australia the other day, uh, and because uh, there, I was on with uh, two or three other people, and the other two people were being critical of this script. Hmm. And everything, and they, this person from Australia, he said, "Why are you going to understand? It's a kids' program." <laughs> uh, and but of course, with the with uh, with earlier uh, writings, it was a family show. Yes. But yeah. uh, I don't. I I think there've been some very good people have criticised Jodie Whittaker, but I think there's a lot of that just because she's a woman, which is not really the accepted thing today, and. Um, but also, the, a lot of her stories started off really well. I loved the Rosa story. Yeah, that's a real highlight, isn't it? Uh, and uh, uh, because that brought home mm. what uh, segregation actually meant. You see, I I thought the segregation was black, uh, uh, black and white, i.e., anybody not white was segregated. But what the story of Rosa brought out was that uh, it was only Negroes and Black Africans that were uh, segregated. Uh, yeah. But uh, Hispanic and Asian people weren't, hmm. which, which makes the discrimination even worse, in my opinion. And I thought, I thought it was extremely well done. Hmm. Extremely well done. And uh, as a fan... Uh, I find it difficult to criticise, but I can, you know, uh, I can freely admit that some things I would have probably done a different way if I was writing it. But there we go. Well, but I, uh, I think any show that lasts as long as Doctor Who, there's always going to be lots of different styles, and some, you know, some things aren't always going to be, at, you know, perfect. So you're going to have ups and downs, uh, but. It's one of those shows that's maintained a very high quality. Especially. It is, and it is very, very interesting. Mm. Uh, watching the very old episodes. I mean, the production values, we all agree, were quite quite appalling, really. Yeah. But the actual stories were brilliant. Mm. And I saw... Uh, um, the meddling monk. I saw a, a track from that. I didn't see the whole episode, mm. but somebody sent me a link to it, and it was very good, very good indeed. And uh, when I watched, see, when I watched Doctor Who, we would watch it as a family. Yeah. And then uh, the television would be switched off. <gasps> Can you imagine such a thing that a television was switched off, <laughs> right? And then as a family, we would discuss the episode. Mm. It yeah. was very, it was, it, and that's what it was like. Well, it was like for me and my family. I, I'm sure there'll be other people say, "Oh no, it wasn't like that." Well, it was for me, and uh, that helped me because the purpose of the program was to be educational. Yeah, and I think that's really why it was discussed as a family. It was really trying to help us as kids learn. Uh, but of course, it got me hooked into some sort of sci-fi, and then my, later on, around 1968, my sister introduced me to Star Trek. Oh, right. And because so then that really Star Trek, and I was of the so I would have been about seven when that started, and I was allowed to stay up to watch that. And then my sister was four years older than me, and um, so she then introduced me to all sorts of other sci-fi wonders, and so that's how. I became more interested in sci-fi yeah. and <clears throat> people ask me if I believe in aliens. Uh, I, 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 I can't 
believe that we are the only thing in existence. That's all. So uh, there's this, you know, when you think of the billions and billions of stars and solar systems, mm. there has to be some form of life form. And, you know, uh, but space is big. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, Douglas Adams, isn't it? Yeah. Space is big. You think going around to the post office, you know, you know. Uh, but um, so there is that if we can get the technology or find the technology or understand the technology that's needed mm. to be able to travel such distances. Uh, I mean, at the moment, we're talking about space travel, but the first problem we've got is the radiation from the sun itself. Mm. So, <laughs> and the planets with their, with their weaker atmospheres than ours. Uh, and of course, you know, more and more we're learning that uh, our planet is a little more fragile than people think. You know, and uh, uh, I don't know. I, I get I get very tired of some of the conspiracy conspiracy theories. Uh, but uh, but it's very clear. I've been. I don't know whether you have, but uh, uh, I have witnessed two <clears throat> partial eclipses hmm. when the moon passes between us and the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I have, I have. Uh, and uh, the, the first one that was in Newmarket. And the first thing I noticed, it was actually the sound. There were no birds or anything. There were no bird sound or anything like that at all. You noticed that. And then it got considerably cooler. Yeah. And it was a partial eclipse. And when you sort of looked up, you could sense the planet in isolation in, this, in space. You could sense it. And that happened a second time for me. And so, therefore, I, I, on a personal basis, I can sense the whole wonderfulness of our planet. And the, the planet is a little spaceship for us to live on and live and breathe. Uh, That's a very <sighs> good way of putting it. Yeah, little, little spaceship. And you say, if that is, if it is our survival pod, then uh, whatever is required to keep it so, mm. regardless of cost, has to be put in place. You know, and there are other people who are more money orientated will go <laughs> and probably have a pulmonary embolism. Now I've said that, but it's a fact of life. Mm. Yeah. Now, if we do space travel, what's the first thing you take with you? Plenty of oxygen. Yeah. That has to be on number one. Number one, yeah. And if somebody says, oh, you only need oxygen for six months, then you take at least 12 months, if not 24 months, you know, because mm -hmm. you don't know what's going to happen out there. No. Yeah. What's the first thing on your shopping list? Oxygen. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess the nice thing about... about science fiction fans they tend to be um you know they like the the imagination of other 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 planets other people what we could become as a, uh, as, a as a species so i think people generally speaking of science fiction fans are potentially quite deep and, and and think about things in a way that perhaps you know fans of other things may not quite have that sort of engagement with it if you if you know what i mean yeah. oh no but uh, you know it is the fantasy of today it becomes the reality of tomorrow and yeah. the proof and the proof of that uh, you know uh, william shatner and leonard Nimoy and and the original cast of star trek hmm. captain kirk had the original flip phone he did yes he, he did. did you know and then you find them you find that they write and sign things on some sort of metallic board. Mm. Well, well, that's the tablet, is it not? Yeah. 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 So, and they had the big screens that you viewed people on. Well, what are we doing now? We're, we're, do, we're doing that now, exactly. And that was in 1968. So I want to meet the people of 1968 and, and, and talk to them and try and find out how it was they could visualise this sort of thing. Mm. Or how does it work? Is it the fantasy has created something and then a scientist or, or engineer has thought, well, actually, let's see if that could work. 
I mean, that's what it is. And I think the only thing that we'll have difficulty with is teleportation. teleportation. Yeah. yeah. But otherwise, everything else goes, because we've got replicators, haven't we? We've got replicators that can make 3D images yeah, of guns, let alone anything else. Guns yeah. and uh, kettles and everything. So it won't be long, long before we find replicators for food. Yeah, yeah. Um, because and we, necessity, yeah. necessity will require that. But yeah. then, then there'll be the question of the nutritional value of a replicated spag spag bowl <laughs> or oh, whatever. Because they have uh, great um, meat in the lab, haven't they, and things like that. And yes. The, and obviously, you can transport a beam of light. I think they. Yes. That's 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 as far as they've got now. Mm. But um, but there we go. Well, I think it's certainly with, with Star Trek, a lot of found, people who were found of Star Trek in the 60s then became engineers and scientists. So they invented the technology because they saw it in Star Trek or, or Doctor Who. Yes, um, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, I think generally, I'll say generally, uh, by nature, humans are inquisitive. Yes. And yes. Some, some are more inquisitive than others. Uh, and some can make a leap of imagination greater than others. Mm. And, you know, and thankfully they do. Otherwise, we'd all still be sitting around fires, beating each other with clubs. Well, yeah. some are still are, they unfortunately. Yes. But, yes, we are, <laughs> yeah. are heading in the right direction. Um, yeah. but before, we, but before we start to wrap it up, is there any other comments you'd like to make about A Good Man Goes to War that we haven't already done so? Well, what can I make about it? I, it was a thoroughly enjoyable, if exhausting, experience for me. Mm. Um, it, it, it made me feel I was part of the Doctor Who family, yeah, which was nice. And as I say, Matt Smith in particular, but everybody else were delightful. And the whole thing wouldn't really function properly without the, the, the people behind the scenes, mm. right down into the runners, the caterers, the engineers, mm. the special effects team, the set designers, absolutely everybody, everybody, everybody. Uh, because to make a good a good show, you really need to have uh, calm around you. And yeah. I did. I had. I had nerves, but they were more. They were more excited nerves. Mm. And especially when I was sat opposite Alex Kingston and Francis Barber, yeah. there was this element, I can't fuck this up. Oh, <laughs> sorry. We, we, can, we, can, we can certainly want to, Simon. No, but there is. But also, and I, uh, and I freely discuss it with uh, most actors, if you find and you have the good fortune of working with actors who you respect, mm. subconsciously, you find that you raise your own bar yeah your own stay there and a lot of fans have spoken to me about the scene we saw this evening mm. uh madam Kavarian with dorian yeah and they like that and clearly the bbc liked that because that was used as a trailer a lot yeah yeah at, been... at the time at the time it was a, a one of the main <laughs> trailers uh absolute uh Definitely. Um, and I know it's difficult for people, particularly in, in, in the last year or so, mm. uh, to get work for some actors. I've been lucky that during lockdown, apart from the initial five months, where I had no idea, no idea whatsoever, you know, there was this thing. But gradually, I had to, I'm, I'm in a position where I earn royalties. <laughs> so royalties come in. So you think, ah, oh, okay. And then people started asking about my books. Uh, then some people started asking me to write articles or, mm. or to read articles and um, mm. do a first edit. And they wanted to pay me for it. I mean, it's a very bizarre situation to be in. <laughs> <laughs> My English teacher, I can tell you, will be spinning in her grave because uh, she said quite openly in front of the class that I would amount to nothing. 
Not sure you want to hear, is it? And uh, she was very pissed off when I passed my O levels in English and English literature because she thought I was going to fail. So, but uh, I think she had a thing about big people. But we, I mustn't say that, must I? <laughs> uh, so, uh, did you always want to be a, an actor, Simon? From was it? It's very funny. Uh, it's. Uh, the reason I've written my trilogy of autobiographical anecdotes is because people were asking you if I had an autobiography. Yeah. And I, uh, so when I started going down to now, I was sort of thinking back. I think deep down, from about the age of seven or eight, hmm. I was saying to myself, oh, I'd love to be in Doctor Who. Hmm. But, only, but to become a professional performer, uh, uh, no, I, I was, it was beaten into me that I was stupid and ridiculous and worthless and incapable of anything. So I, so when I was younger, I had major low esteem. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, but when I was going to go to university, but my grandfather who uh, I was brought up by my grandparents and my grandfather, when I was taking my A-levels in 1980, had a massive stroke. So I decided I wouldn't go to university until the year after. Hmm. Uh, so I felt I fell into a job in the civil service, but then I enjoyed the job in the civil service. I sat a civil service exam and got promoted and was working in Westminster. Hmm. Um, and then whilst working in Westminster, they paid, oh, jokingly, they, they said that they'd pay for me to do a, a degree. And so I did a, a degree in business administration right. because uh, they wouldn't support any arty farty degree. But I did business administration specialising in the arts because I thought if I'm going back to the civil service, I'd quite like to work um, in the Ministry of Arts. Uh, 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 because now you've got a whole ministry is it arts and it's culture and sport and that now yeah. whereas whereas really the ministry of, of arts and science was, was a broom cupboard in the environmental department but uh, so that's what I aimed that's was it but then <laughs> but then uh, the civil service was being um, thinned out Mm. Uh, and so they offered us a bag of money if we chose to leave. And today you would call that voluntary redundancy, but they didn't call it that at the time. Mm. So I oomed an ard and I thought I'd take the gamble. My, grand, my grandfather said, if you want to be a, an actual thing, just go for it. Don't get to the age of 80 and say I wish. My grandmother wanted to stay because in her mind it was a job for life, but mm. she didn't know what was coming in the future, there's no such thing as a job of life. Anymore. So I came to a compromise. I said, what I'll do is I'll audition for three colleges. And if none of them offer me a place, hmm. uh, then I'll stay in the civil service. Well, of the three, two offered me a place. And that's why I'm sitting here talking to you now. I'm very grateful they, that they did. Um... Yeah. And that's it. And um, I think also, because it is, it is interesting how... Uh, things in your past can affect how you think even today mm. because I had this low esteem uh, I I just accepted whatever came along so I will freely admit I've never really had a game plan with my acting career yeah uh, some say that was foolish for me they some say that means you don't have any ambition but what I will say is if a lot of stuff I did actually got aired mm. and got produced properly, then maybe my status would be higher and greater than it is today. I mean, there are there are six, six pilots I did for comedy shows for the BBC between 1988 and 1992. And in each pilot, I was would have been a regular character. Mm. And uh, had any one of them been picked to go to series, then things might have been very different for me. But they weren't. They weren't even. They weren't. They weren't even screened once. But I was paid, and I joke with people that I, I, 
for a long time, I had a very good living, appearing in nothing at all. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, but there we go. So some actors do have a game plan and it works for them. Mm. Uh, whereas I just, because people were saying I wouldn't get any work at all. Mm. But uh, whatever work was offered, I took it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of actors do the same thing. They, um... And I think you have to, because you have no real control. The only control I had for many years was, do I do the job or not? Mm. Yeah. And of course, if you're offered something, you're not going to turn it down, really, even if it, even if it is a piece of shite. Well, well, I think there's very few actors that are in a position to um, to turn things down. And, and the, the, it, it, on on an interview, people would always ask actors, "What made you want to do this?" And and it was either well, it, either the money or or it was work, and I took it. So if you're pure business yeah. and artistic motivation behind most things of course it's, it's yeah and um and uh what i in some ways i'm pleased that when doctor who came along it was later mm. in some ways because i because i did any job that came along i have a uh, a very broad cv as such yeah. uh, uh, i've done everything from panto to shakespeare uh, and I've done all sorts of genre mm. of entertainment, mm. uh, which is very useful, I think, particularly when you have to think on your feet at an audition. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, 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 I mean, I've, um, through, I think, through doing a lot, including improvisation. Yeah. I read a script and generally I have a knack of uh, uh, hitting the nail on the head as to what the producers are looking for. Yeah. Not always, but generally. Mm. So that helps. And that's, I was going to use the word instinct, but I suppose it is because in, all instinct becomes is really uh, drawing from your knowledge of experience. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course it is, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and sometimes there, there isn't a time to talk to somebody mm. you know, about the mm. what a brick what a brick is thinking about <laughs> <laughs> you know uh there isn't the time and you just got to instinctively and if it's a good script mm. if it's a good script it helps you tremendously and it also helps if you've got a director that, that can actually communicate yeah. <clears throat> uh, i mean there have been times where the directors themselves haven't been able to verbalize clearly what their thought pattern is and they'll waffle on waffle or waffle on and then they'll say well you you know you know what i mean mm. and of course you don't <laughs> and then then go action mm. no 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 <laughs> but we've all experienced that and 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 of course for actors in particular i would say if they have a bad day in the office the feeling is you'll never work again yeah Whereas other people outside the industry, if they're bad day in the office, they go home, go, go to bed, have a good sleep, wake up and start again. But uh, there is that sensation, I'll never get work again. Yeah. Throw into that some pompous asses that also suggest, I know a lot of people, you'll never work in this. <laughs> and of course, when you're younger, you take that to heart, whereas now you can only laugh at that. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, so all I can say is, I'm one of the very lucky ones that I do get regular work. Mm. Um, I wish I could have more theatre work, yeah. but but with uh, television and movie wages. Well, that's yeah, that's the dream, isn't it? Really, you know, that's it because uh, that's the dream. But there we go, and I'm quite happy to do whatever the next job is. Mm. But people have to appreciate that at the end of the day, I still got my bills to pay. Oh yeah, 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 but we, we all do, don't we? Um, uh, the one thing we, we did wanted to come back to was your high Potter auditions and your yeah, ah oh, um, yes, okay, yeah. Now that was now that was ten years earlier. That was ten years, you know. That was the year two thousand. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I got the phone call from my agent. She says, "I'm just faxing you through a script." <laughs> That's the days of faxes. Mm. Uh, and it was about two o'clock in the afternoon 
Uh, you got an audition for Harry Potter to be the fat friar at 10 o'clock the following morning. And I have to confess, at that point, I've never read it. Right. I did have, I had a copy of The Philosopher's Stone on my shelf, but I've just never read it. Hmm. So there was a slight panic. But a friend of mine was a real Harry Potter anorak. And yes. she was she was able to tell me exactly who the fat fryer was and even told me what page it was where he first appears. Hmm. <laughs> I can't remember it now. But so that evening I sat and read a few chapters. Hmm. So and the first question at the audition is, have you read The Philosopher's Stone? Yes. So my sidestep answer was, oh, I know exactly who the fat fryer is. You know, so. That's how, anyway, there were about 20 of us, I think. Mm. And then it got whittled down to 13. Mm. And then down to seven. And then down to the last three. By which time, I couldn't care if they gave me the job or not. <laughs> uh, but I did, I know I did a good audition and then when it was down to the last three. Because the casting director, as I came out of the room, she said, do you know that was the best audition she'd seen? Uh, but they still took the best part of a month before I got the phone call, well, by which time I just assumed I hadn't got it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, so that was the, the audition process and, and an example. Uh, but it was also at the time, like Doctor Who, at the time, Harry Potter was the thing to be associated with. And it was really exciting. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were all, you know, the ghosts, there were four main ghosts. And we, we were invited onto radio shows. So there were articles in the Observer magazine, all sorts of things. All oh, hype, 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 hype. Very exciting, very exciting, very exciting. Uh, we did some wonderful work. Uh, we, did, we were contracted for the first four films. We did a, a lot of uh, improvised, what they call generic scenes, that they could just drop the ghosts in, mm. you know, and things. Uh, and so when it came... When it came to the uh, uh, to the premiere of the Philosopher's Stone, you've got to remember it was the premiere of the Philosopher's Stone. They sent a car to pick me up from my house and drove me to Leicester Square. Mm -hmm. Right, so you're thinking, oh my God, this is it. And then when we sat and watched the film and saw that basically all our stuff had been cut out, I, I was lucky that the friar clings on for a few seconds. Yeah. I will. I will admit. On the way home, I had a, a bit of a cry because it was so so frustrating. Because yeah. I didn't seriously expect it to levitate me to superstardom, but I did think, taking on board the amount of work that we did, mm. that it would um, increase the status slightly. Mm. Yeah, that's what I think. So it was very very frustrating, mm. um, and so two things came from that. From that point. Uh, so I wouldn't go completely mad. I said, that's it. My acting now is going to be my profitable hobby. Right. That's my, my profitable hobby. Uh, and, uh, and funny enough, after that, my hit rate for auditions, I got, uh, it sort of went up from sort of one in eight to about one in four. Because I was a bit more relaxed about it. I actually had this, well, I either get it or I don't. And so I started judging the auditions myself. If I was happy with what I did, that's it. They just chose somebody else because they didn't choose me. I would kick myself and not quite self-flagellate. But, uh, uh, but uh, if, if I knew I'd messed up an audition, I would be very angry with myself. Mm. But then there were occasions, you know, that I come out thinking, oh, that was really, I really enjoy that. I wouldn't be surprised if I get it, right? Hear nothing, right? <laughs> and then there are other times I'm kicking myself and almost crying on the way home from an audition to find by the time I got home, there's a message on my aunt's machine saying I got the job. So it's, uh, you just don't know, mm. just don't know. But, uh, uh, but then 10 years down the line, I get Doctor Who and suddenly, People think I'm wonderful. <laughs> they want to know if I'm available for this, this, that, and the other. And I'm even a visiting tutor at some drama colleges where now, when they ask me about the, 
for Harry Potter, I, I have to joke and I say, you can't take yourself too seriously because after all, <clears throat> my name in the credits at the end of the Philosopher's Stone is on screen longer than I am. <laughs> and, uh, and that's it, you know. Mm. So, but I enjoy what I do. I'm very serious about my work. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, but I can't take myself too seriously. Oh, yeah. And I've, I've done some wonderful things. There was a wonderful series with the BBC called Puppy Love. Hmm. where we got to work with animals as well yeah uh, so and that was an example that was a it, initially it was a pilot hmm. uh, and it was written by joanna scannon and vicky pepperdine pepperdine who were in uh, getting on with joe brown oh, and yeah. i i was i was uh, i got an episode of getting on because they were looking for a bariatric patient in other words they wanted someone the size of a barrage balloon to sit in a bed and uh, so whatever I did, they liked. And the next thing I know is my agent gets a call to say, um, if Simon is available between this date, and that date, he's the script. If he if he likes it, um, the part of Tony for Zachary is his. Hmm. So so I said to my agent, don't bother sending me the script. The answer is yes. <laughs> But it was really good fun, mm. very good fun. And Joanna Scanlon and Vicky Pepperdine were very, and uh, Vicky, uh, uh, Joe, Joe Willits, uh, they uh, they were very kind to me. Uh, and uh, I had a wonderful time, learnt an awful lot. Mm. It's just a shame he didn't go to a second series. But hey ho, there you go. Yeah. That's showbiz lovey. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, the last thing I wanted to ask you, Simon, was about yeah. um, the Hawk Chronicles that you were involved with. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm going to show this one. The Hawk Chronicles. You could go to uh, hawkchronicles.com. It's, um, it's an American spoof sci-fi detective series. Mm. Uh, and I was invited to play a spoof MI6 agent called Tony Simon. Hmm. And, they had, and apparently they chose the name before they asked me. And it's just that my husband's name is Tony. <laughs> and then there's me. So there was a uh, thing. And um, I was asked as a guest appearance for episode 103. Uh, and I've just finished recording episode 161. It, it is really good fun. It's an audio thing that you just uh, draw down or click on and you can hear it. But if you go to uh, hawkchronicles.com, uh, you can it, it's easily navigatable if that's the word and uh, you should be able to listen to it well, no, i'm doing this this weekend so that's uh that's funny taken care of um yeah. so uh well sam i just wanted to say on behalf of myself and everybody uh watching um how honored we were that you joined us for this evening uh, well thank thank you for asking i have had a thoroughly good time and to actually see the episode again after a long time it, it just emphasised what I say. I thought it was a damn good episode. It holds up very well, doesn't it? Because I hadn't seen it for a few years, and it's, uh, I, I, I'd say it's a, a golden age of, of Doctor Who, another golden age of yes. Doctor Who. So. Can, I just, uh, can I just mention, if anybody wants to know anything else about me, they can get my my books, my, my autobiographical anecdotes. My Dalek has a puncture, puncture yeah. and my Dalek has another puncture. Yeah. And then the, the third in the trilogy, Let Zygons Be Zygons, hopefully will be published in the summer. So, and is uh, that fan, Phantom Publishing doing that one? Uh, no, no. Uh, fan, uh, fantastic Books Publishing. Fantastic Books, yeah. Yeah, Fantastic Books Publishing. Uh, but uh, they can get these books online mm -hmm. uh, and they can get them from, net, uh, from Amazon. Good, yeah. uh, or, or if they want signed copies, they can contact me either by Facebook uh, or they can uh, contact me uh, <clears throat> on, from my webpage, which is uh, which is my surname without the hyphen. So it's fisherbecker.info. Lovely. Perfect. So, yeah, I think everyone's got their Christmas presents. Uh, <laughs> out for yes, and hopefully, and then, and then ideally by, by Christmas, so there will be the, about all three are out. Uh, and also by Christmas, there should be at least one other book. 
Because your first book is, is it based on your stage, um, your one man show that you did. Well, I did. It's, it's it's very funny, you know. Life is very strange because things have evolved rather than planned. Mm. So, uh, so doing the convention circuit, of course, there are all these panels, and a couple of times in America, the uh, the invigilator, as they call them in the states, didn't turn up. So I was just sort of pushed on mm. and told just get on with it. <clears throat> and I'm not a stand up comic. So it was a bit disturbing. So I developed a PowerPoint presentation for future situations like that. And so the PowerPoint just showed pictures and had a few words, which for me, it was like the, the interviewer. And I'd say, I click, I go, ah, oh, I can talk about that. So it sort of developed into a one man show. And, uh, 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 and, um, and what? Uh, yeah, dimension. And in one night, there was uh, Dan Grubb from Fantastic Books Publishing, and he said, "You've got to put this in book form." And that's how the books came. Oh, sorry, Simon. No, uh, my the, in, the internet connection just went for the last. Could you repeat what you said for the last thirty seconds? It, we just lost your your audio just a moment ago. Okay, oh. I I was just saying that. Um, uh, it, it developed into a one-man show, and at one evening, Dan Grubb from Fantastic Books Publishing was in the audience, and he drew me up a contract uh, there and then on the back of his programme <laughs> and said I had to put it into book form. So that's how I've got these two books so far and the third one on its way. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. So, um, well, as I say, thank you again for, for joining us this wonderful evening. Um, yes. We've all, we, I, I, can, I think I speak... For everybody, so we thoroughly enjoyed uh, ourselves and just talking about all, all your career in general has been a, a really fun, uh, fun experience for um, for, for myself. So well, thank you very much. I'd be very happy to do it again. I might hold you to that because I we could perhaps do your your next appearance in Doctor Who. So that might yeah. be. So, uh, <laughs> you never know. I'll, you I'll, never I'll, know. Be, I'll be in touch, Simon. But I I'll um I, I wish you good luck with your your deadline. Yes. And it all, all goes well. And um, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll keep in touch. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so, to everybody out there, Doc Tor Who? <laughs> have a lovely weekend, Simon. Lovely to talk talking to you. Bye bye. Bye bye.